Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, the first of a, of a series um, of webinars on um, the potential impacts of, of um, the current COVID situation. Um, the first one that we are dealing with this afternoon is navigating bridge rounds. And I think since uh, March, the world has certainly changed to a great degree. Um, the Chancellor acknowledged yesterday that we're in a serious recession. Uh, the Bank of England have forecast a 30% drop in UK GDP for the first half year, and uh, this could be the largest recession since the Great Frost of 1709, um, which I hadn't heard of previously. Um, but these are certainly unprecedented times, and uh, we, we would like to help you navigate through them um, so far as we can. Um, I'm joined today by Mike Labriola, who's a partner at Wilson Sonsini, based in Washington and New York, and also by Evgenia Plotnikova, um, who is a partner at Dawn Capital. And um, Evgenia was going to kick off uh, this afternoon's session with um, some insight into market perspectives. Um, delighted uh, to be to be part of this presentation. So, as, as Howard uh, just mentioned, my name is Evgenia. Um, I'm a partner at uh, Dawn. Uh, we are an early stage venture capital fund. We invest in um, Series A and Series B, typically post product market fit. When you when you start uh, uh, scaling your your teams and turbocharging growth, uh, and we focus exclusively on B2B software. And, and then I'll cover. Uh, cover some some of that more specifically, but also very um, very happy to talk more generally about the general market perspective. So what I'd love to cover in this presentation is, is a few different points. Um, and I know there's an opportunity to ask questions, so please please do, and and I'll try and answer some of them as as we go along. So I'll quickly uh, zip through some of the public markets, uh, specifically with one question in mind. Also, you know, software and B2B. Uh, tends to, uh, is this more resilient uh, segment of the market? Then I'll give a few, a few perspectives on what we see in the private markets, um, specifically you know, VC investing in the time in the time of COVID. Um, then I'd love to share um, how we think uh, about our portfolio companies and, and sort of what what we have been doing with uh, our wonderful uh, founders uh, through navigating the, the crisis um, and some of the frameworks uh, we have been using internally. And then to close it off, to just kind of discuss uh, what, what's possibly, what's next uh, in, in, in those markets. So if I start off uh, with, uh, with the public markets, and um, there I go. Um, so look, um, I've allowed myself a meme here, but frankly, the, the initial reaction uh, to, to the current uh, macro has definitely been that, that of, a, of a confusion. You know, some some people panicked. Uh, others uh, reassured each other that you know this is fine. Um, it's it, and it's certainly been been a fairly unprecedented situation when it's not just a very well known uh, macro of what a recession could look like or what what does an economic slowdown look like, but also uh, that that of a pandemic, which certainly introduces a, a huge element of uncertainty. Uh, and this is something we, we we've definitely seen um, through the public markets. So if we uh, if we turn to uh, to, to some some of the things that we've seen in, in, in the immediacy of the uh, of the pandemic, you know, in, in March uh, that was that was a, a pretty pretty sharp drop off and a historic end to what has been an 11 years uh, of bull market. Um, since then, there's obviously been a, a, a huge degree of volatility, uh, markets going up and down. Uh, and sort of trying to, to really price it, and then again com comes back to the question of uh, of an unprecedented situation that at times uh, many of the public investors haven't been haven't been able to price. Now, what we find uh, that's been interesting in in this situation, and, and and since then, and kind of unlike the rest of the market, the public cloud index um, has recovered, uh, and this this is 29% uh, up versus six months ago, and, and frankly, almost as high as, as it used to be um, from, from the trading perspective. And as you, as you see on the slide, um, 
you know, as S and P and and Dow Jones continue uh, continue to be in decline, while while, uh, while some of the software businesses um, have have enjoyed um, a recovery, and so that kind of uh, poses a, a natural question uh, as to as to where the valuations have been. So th that's very true for for the multiples. Um, so although they've dropped by 38%, we're now back to the April 2019 levels. And um, you know, still higher than, than any any period prior prior to that, um, which which has obviously uh, been quite different to, to what we've seen in, in some of the uh, in some of the other stocks. Now, part of this is 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 due to to the massive and transformational shift uh, that cloud has brought to the broader B two B ecosystem. So, if we look if we look in spending and we look throughout the year, so that in this chart there. You can see uh, cloud spending since 1995. You, you'd see that um, historically, in, in every market downturn and every recession in the past three crashes, we had 20 uh, uh, over 20 uh, point declines in, soft, in software spending growth rates as we went along. And it seems that um, you know today the impact on the, sp on the spending is there, but it hasn't been as observable. It, it's mostly you know, slower, a, a small decline, and a sort of a, a fair, uh, a fairly flat uh, impact. And part of that has to do with the shift to the cloud, with the subscription models that um, SaaS businesses are, are able to command with favorable working capital, unlike some 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 of the other business models that, that we see in the market. Now, obviously, there is there is a, a degree of variability. Within the cloud stack, you know, different different uh, sectors are showing varying degree of resilience. Uh, they're, they're obvious uh, winners. Uh, there's obviously the, the zooms of the world. Uh, the, there's obviously any tools that are really centered around collaboration or communication. Uh, you know, Twilio, Atlassian, Box, Slack are, are great examples uh, of, of companies that fared better. And then there's a few others, uh, particularly around IT and infrastructure, that perhaps haven't been uh, haven't been as resilient within within the broad kind of SaaS um, SaaS sphere. Again, that being said, this this is getting a little bit more granular. We could talk a little bit uh, about some of the subsectors uh, that that we have seen, um, but we've certainly certainly noted uh, certain uh, certain differences in in the public market. Now, obviously, this is sort of on the on the public side, and I very very much hope that every every person on on this call will will eventually become a public company if you're a founder. But what it, what is it that we're we're seeing uh, in the private market? So VC investing uh, has obviously seen seen an impact as well. Um, now, we we typically see a lot of things on on Twitter with people people sort of saying you know we're we're in business uh, we're open for business 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 as usual the reality is you know there has been a slowdown um, and and a you know in in private markets as the world digests this impact of the crisis uh, in a similar uh, in a similar fashion that we have seen an impact um, in, uh, in in the in the public markets so you know in, in through Q1. Uh, there's been globally uh, eight percent less that has been invested uh, in in sort of global venture uh, dollars, uh, and then particularly in the early stage, which is where we operate, and the thick graph there that shows specifically Series A and Series uh, B, uh, we do see um, a decline uh, in terms of uh, both number of deals as well as as well as the capital invested. Now, that being said, this this is kind of showing. The big, the big uh, global trends, but let, let me let me come back to software specifically uh, for for a second there. And you know, we we here at Dawn are, are confident uh, that B two B software will remain a huge opportunity for venture capital. So obviously, the things that we have seen is if if I'm allow myself that calling it old stack, you know, the lead group of incumbents, um, very long implementation cycles, bespoke solutions, your SAP, Oracle, your IBMs of the world, the type of businesses where you know in the 80s and 90s, if you bought um, Oracle or SAP, you, you certainly wouldn't get fired as as an IT manager. And we're slowly shifting to this new stack, right? So the segmented. SaaS universe, and where behind every logo on this page is is a multi-billion-dollar market opportunity. Um, it's nine hundred billion dollars today, and it's only likely to continue in in, in our in our uh, 
uh, eyes. Uh, part of this is obviously that shift from on-prem to cloud. We're right? still very early in this tr transition, so we're about you know 10, 15 percent penetration, I'd say roughly, in in, in that shift. Uh, and we, we we're only likely to continue uh, seeing that. But in addition to that, uh, you know, a lot of pen and paper processes are continuing to get uh, digitized, uh, and so that that's a whole another opportunity. So that means for us, and I know we were talking a lot about uh, bridge rounds uh, during this call today, but for us, we, we believe there's no such thing as a bargain uh, for great companies. To give you a few, few examples, so one of our businesses, uh, Calibra, has raised an 130 million Series E at, at, at a north of a $2 billion valuation, and that, that was announced in, in March, right, right at the peak of the crisis. Both Sigma and HashiCorp uh, have also recently raised and again, we're talking about $2 billion, $5 billion valuation. So uh, the companies that, uh, that can, can kind of tap into humongous markets that have set themselves up for success, we still continue them raising. Um, uh, we continue seeing them raise, um, apologies. Uh, to, to sort of not, not sort of disclose any names just yet, but do watch this space, uh, we, we're in the process of finalizing an exciting Series A, uh, and we just had one of our businesses where we invested at Series A, closing their, their Series B uh, financing. Both transactions um, have happened during March, April, and, and May, and one of the deals has actually seen, well, actually both of the deals have, have actually uh, seen fully uh, remote uh, digital DD. So very much possible um, and, and very much uh, you know, at times likely. Um, the other bit sort of uh, perhaps turning a little bit away from um, what just we're seeing in the market, and if we zoom into our portfolio, uh, I, I think one of the one of the questions that that was submitted was around um, you know building conversations in the company stories in, in the virtual uh, world. Um, so let, let me cover a couple of those uh, things. First of all, what uh, what we what we've done with a lot of our businesses is try and and, and think about uh, you know what is what is the defensive mode that you can go into, and it goes a little bit further than just saying look. Uh, cash is king. So let's explore, particularly for sales businesses, some of this. Now, I appreciate it might not be relevant for everyone, but some of this framework might still be uh, applicable. So obviously, cash, uh, absolutely uh, num number one on, 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 on this metric. Uh, you know, if you have less than nine months um, cash, that's probably not looking great. Uh, it's uh, raising with, with uh, messy metrics might not be uh, ideal either. Uh, 18 months plus it is probably uh, a sufficient amount uh, of, of runway ahead of the turbulence. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time discussing with our businesses, um, who do they sell to? I mean, obviously we, we're a B2B investor, so we've explored um, how much of exposure do our businesses have to uh, offline retail, uh, to, to, to travel, to entertainment, and figure out you know, which are the big accounts that we really need to, to hold on to, the customer conversations that we need to, to, to address and see whether there is any increase in churn or our customers are, are unaffected. Now, obviously, there is some immediate impact, but things that are you know, large transformational projects um, that cost um, multiple seven-figure sums uh, might, still, might still see an impact. Some of our businesses do have a transactional element to them, uh, so we, we've tried to assess that. Obviously, transactional businesses are phenomenal in, in, in the times of, of rapid growth. Uh, this is obviously a, a challenge, or can be a challenge, uh, for a software business uh, in in the time in the time of a crisis, where the recurring uh, model of uh, multi-year contracts, payment upfront, is is a lot kinder on on the cash flow and the working capital. With the rest of the marketing approach, I'll, I'll zoom into it in a second, so I'll I'll park that. Uh, we discussed a lot about the lead gen, so you know whether whether you're an in-person driven. Uh, business with a lot of trade shows, a lot of events, or whether it's a mix of digital and an in-person. So far, we've, we've, seen, uh, we've seen people accumulating webinars just like this one, and uh, we, we have seen uh, some sort of pick up in, in the amount of, of leads uh, that people are, are seeing. That also uh, includes sales. Look, uh, a lot of big contracts are closed uh, with a handshake, um, and field sales have been a big part of, of organizations for a long time. But frankly, not 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 sort of just um, 
uh, just just in, uh, in in sort of very large contracts, even for smaller contracts around 50, 60k, uh, that handshake has been important. So we have been assessing with our businesses opportunities to shift to inside sales, opportunities to to utilize um, digital tools to to enable the sales force. Uh, a great example in our portfolio is a business called Showpad. They do a lot of training uh, around remote selling. And they themselves have really been pivoting to, uh, not not pivoting, but enabling their their sales force to to really sell uh, sell online. Uh, and then finally, obviously, implementation. I think that's that's true for all of the B two B businesses. Figuring out whether being on site uh, is is needed or whether remote uh, remote is, is possible. Now that has been um, our framework here, Don, to try and, and really unpick your your defensive tactics in the current environment as the markets were crashing. How do I deal with the situation? Now, as we, as we hopefully everyone's saying to get a little bit of their head under the water, the next stage is, is, is offense. And that's more around that, that marketing message that sparked for a second. And so there are the, the two axes where we, we want the people to position themselves on. And we've had fantastic debates with some of companies there is around your messages on urgency and your messages on ROI. So on urgency, it's really about, you know, uh, has your end customer have a, um, has their sort of speed and the propensity to engage with your product change. So obviously with regards to Zoom, uh, you know, everyone has kind of, was, was kind of quickly installing Zoom, really going after it. Uh, with, with G Suite, um, there has been perhaps a slower shift for people to shift to um, collaborative uh, work tools online. So where would you position yourself on the urgency scale? And then finally, ROI, um, where, where do you see between a softer productivity improvement gains versus hard kind of take take your cost um take your cost out messaging now obviously with, with regards to messaging important to note um that you have to think through what is a permanent change in your messages versus temporary change and not to overcorrect uh, for, for, for temporary but the roi stories tend to be quite clear particularly in the recessionary environment um, and so we, what we're trying to do with all the businesses that we have backed is to really try to position them to the top and to the right, where there is um, there is an ROI message and the customer feels an urgent need uh, to to go and, and purchase that um, that product. Um, so those those are kind of a couple of tools that we have been we have been using uh, internally, and I hope that answers some of the messages around building conversation in the company story. Um, conscious of time here, I've, I've overrun ever so slightly, um, but just to cover off of, of kind of what we what we see next uh, in terms of in terms of the market, um, and uh, I wanted to g actually give a, a big message of, of positivity. So you know, every crisis from from our perspective is an opportunity for innovation, and we firmly believe that for for the utilization is, is yet to come beyond just everything remote and frankly you know, the multiple low role e-commerce businesses we, we, we've seen popping up um, as, as there is a slowdown in the market that, that we're witnessing you know some people might call us myopic cheerleaders uh, but we don't think that's true the, the one thing that the crisis has accelerated without a doubt uh, and it will hopefully make up all the damage that COVID-19 has done to our economy is that, that acceleration of digitalization. Uh, in the face um, of, of all of COVID, with our lives appended, with the ships burned, with and forced westward, we have all become digital pioneers. And I've given a few examples there of, of the industries we all know and can touch, whether it's energy, print, media, airlines, education, uh, where um, th there's still a very, very long uh, game to come uh, in, in the wave of, of the digital movement. You know, globally, with, with the OPAC supply chains that we have, uh, which historically been all about cost and uniformity, everyone is seeking resilience, innovation, and speed. And here at Dawn, we very much believe that all of this can be revolutionized by software. And so we actually think that as our common future got a little dimmer, FTAC has definitely got a lot, uh, a lot brighter. And, uh, and I'll stop there. I think that's my cue to come in here, Evgenia. Yeah, yeah. um, it's Mike uh, Labriello from Wilson Sons. Andy, thank you for uh, the handoff there. And, and actually, I really want to become an LP and a Dawn fund here based on your positivity there. That was actually um, <laughs> please that, do. That was, that was please actually really welcome exciting. you with open I, arms. <laughs> uh, I, I I I really enjoyed that because actually I I I, I love the mantra that that one of my clients. Uh, keeps repeating the, the Churchill line about never waste a good crisis, and you know it's 
it, for it, as, as awful and tragic as, as, as some of the situation is here, um, you know, with the with the news about about uh, the health situation, um, it's an amazingly disruptive and, and interesting time. Um, uh, so I, I think we're, you know, from our perspective, as as um, you know, a firm that's headquartered in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I thought I'd just give a couple a couple minutes on on kind of what we're seeing on the kind of the U.S. side of things um, before we get into uh, to Howard's um, kind of deeper dive on on bridge financing here. But um, you know, I think there definitely is a, a a overwhelming attitude of of you know things. There's still a lot of good things going on. Um, and and actually, I, I I thought that was a great segue there. Um, the one thing that I I did think was noteworthy that I had heard from a lot of our um, our our companies and uh, and investors uh, across uh, our relationships um, was kind of the shift in attention, um, you know, between the uh, um, uh, where where investors are are kind of focusing their efforts. Um, you know, there were kind of was an adage that for a long time it was you know 80% of the time was sent up, was looking for the new deal, and 20% of the time was was tending to the portfolio for a lot of these funds, and it's kind of reversed um, in the past several months because I think there was a a moment of you know how do we how do we circle the wagon and make sure that the portfolio is um, is surviving and thriving, um, and that's uh, led you know to a number of bridge financings, um, largely because of just the you know short term uncertainty. Um, you know it's a uh, you know cash is is suddenly not as as readily available. Um, certain industries that, that that are underlying a number of these companies, these venture back companies. Um, may be put on hold, for example, you know, they're, they're an entire segment of customer bases may not be able to uh, transact um, right now. Um, so, you know, we're definitely seeing a lot of, you know, even good companies that, that have great, you know, fundamentals who have to wait out, you know, how they go to market. Um, and so the effect of that, we, we actually saw in the past uh, uh, couple months, particularly in April, um, you know, we saw 148% increase. This is just raw numbers. I haven't actually seen the, the finalized numbers from our, our, our firm here, but um, in the number of convertible note deals um, as compared to the April in the prior year. Um, and overall, we did see an, uh, an increase in overall number of financing. So both numbers of, of bridge rounds and number of priced rounds. Um, but there definitely was a swing back towards, um, you know, valuations were uncertain, uh, uncertain, um, I also think, you know, uh, I think um, I'm going to give credit to Evgenia and, and the Dawn team for, um, you know, kind of looking at the long term there. I think there's a number of uh, funds that will be opportunistic and say, you know, how do we how do we kind of, you know, take advantage of some of this position? Not many, but at the same time, there's a number out there that will put pressure on on deals. Um, and so, you know, founders were kind of pushing back with how do we defer on, on valuation in different ways by using whether it's convertible notes or saves. Um, and again, these are typically relatively small rounds. So you're talking in the range of, you know, about one two million dollars uh, US. Um, you're not talking about big bridge rounds. I think that a lot of these is, uh, or a lot of this uptick in, in bridge rounds is definitely how do we survive the next quarter, the next couple months, the next, you know, for the smaller companies, maybe the next year. Um, but it's really about making sure that everyone has enough dry powder to, you know, figure out the uncertainty of the next couple months there. Um, we have started to see a little bit of, of activity around kind of change in traditional terms, and, and, and I'll let Howard kind of go into the mechanics um, as we get a little further along here. But one thing that was noteworthy that I thought was a little interesting is, although you, you know, historically use things like discounts in the next round and, and valuation caps, those somewhat lost their meaning because the valuations were kind of all over the place. Um, you know, we, we were... In the between March and April, I think I had clients that were, you know, looking at the, the market on any given day and saying, well, should we, you know, be recalibrating around an expectation of a drop in 30%, 10%, 20%, nothing. Um, and, and I think what we just saw in the in the preceding slides was, um, you know, for some sectors, it, it, in the long run, it, it may well have been nothing. Um, but there's a number of sectors that definitely, you know, went through a lot of volatility. And so, um we did see a lot of investors start to, you know, push for larger change of control premiums um, uh, as a means of, of just kind of protecting while the, the notes haven't converted um, because they wanted to have some sense of, of making sure that they had um, a little more uh, protection for deploying the capital in the near term there. So um, the last feature that we saw that was kind of interesting in the past couple um, 
couple of weeks was also kind of increased pressure from investors to what I would call pre-negotiate the next round. So starting to push more uh, definition um, into the, you know, what, is the, what does the converted equity look like into the convertible note? Now that's a little unusual because you're usually trying to go fast in, in those bridge rounds. It's trying to get, get cash into the company. Um, and so, you know, slowing it down with having that pre-negotiation on certain terms um, definitely adds what I would call kind of sand in the gears. Um, but we have started to see a little more of that. And, and frankly, I think that's a function. I would say I, I, I see that more in the um, uh, on, on our deals where we're, we're working with our UK uh, partners on that one there. Um, and simply, I think it's the, the, the difference in kind of the, the history of the two markets. I think the U.S. markets, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more, I would say there's probably a lot more money moving around relative to the UK tech ecosystem. And as a result, there's um, uh, there's kind of less pressure from investors to um, uh, to push for that pre-negotiation. I also think there's just more um, more funds in the U.S. that have been through downturns. Um, the existing U.K. tech ecosystem, as it is now, you know, was roughly ten billion dollars last year, but ten years ago it was it was a hundred million um, invested cap uh, uh, in invested capital into the U.K. tech e ecosystem. It's grown radically, but by comparison, the, the U.S. market is 130 billion, um, and so and it's it's you know 10 years ago it had been through a downturn, it had been through the dot com downturn in a different way. So, I do think that there the the impact of the in, the history of the investors in the U.K. Um, definitely is kind of nudging towards some pre negotiation on some of the cross border rounds that we see there. So, um, definitely some interesting trends that are developing, but. The good news is this tends to be a bit of a, a, a it's, it's a true bridge and, and we're going to be getting to price rounds and, uh, and, and other transactions in, in due time here. And with that, I think maybe I'll hand it to Howard here to kind of go into a little deeper dive on the kind of the mechanics of, of these different types of bridge uh, transactions here. So Howard, all yours. Great. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, and thanks, Evgeny, for the for that very positive spin. And, and, and um, I, I will try not to be too downbeat um, because I think um, that, that there's a, there is a lot to be positive about because you know, companies who um, do get to uh, to close a bridge round, uh, you know, are obviously being supported by uh, typically existing shareholders. Um, the, so the the slide in front of you um, is is the slide that I typically sort of talk to when we're um, talking about equity rounds, but loan notes are obviously up there. I think before we get to um, a convertible loan note, um, you know, I guess the unique scenario of the last couple of months has meant that there's been um, quite a lot of support from the UK government in terms of um, tax deferrals, um, the furlough system. Um, we, you know, we've got seven and a half million employees in the UK. Um, on furlough at the moment, um, the, the, there are the various um, loan schemes um, that have been implemented. The coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, or C bills, um, C bills plus for larger companies, um, and more recently the bounce back loan. Um, but the C bills loans, you know, ha haven't really been um, suitable for venture-backed companies um, who don't have, um, who certainly don't have revenues, um, for example, but you know, who, who are not profitable. Um, so the government has, has also uh, recently announced the, um, uh, uh, some additional grant funding to the tune of 750 million um, via Innovate UK, and also the Future Fund, um, which we'll, we'll talk about um, later on. So there's, there are plenty of government supports. Um, there's also venture debt, uh, which and, and there are active lenders in the market still providing venture debt, um, which I guess in the pyramid would sit uh, at the mezzanine level and usually comes with equity kickers. Um, but today we're going to concentrate on loan notes and similar convertible instruments. Um, so a convertible loan note, as as Mike alluded to a few moments ago, you know, are designed to be um, quickly implemented. 
are designed to be valuation agnostic so that you don't have to have the discussion here and now on what the right valuation for the company is um, and you allow the investors down the line to have that discussion. Um, but there are often limits, so valuation caps um, are a relatively common feature of a convertible loan note. Um, from the investor's perspective, they are providing a loan to the business, so that sits above equity in the event that the worst happens to the company. You know, they will sit there as, as a creditor of the business um, and will only flip to equity when the company has survived the bridge period and gone out and successfully raised equity capital, um, which um, is the the ultimate goal um, of, a, of a bridge financing. So that's seen as success, but in the interim, the lenders you know, are just that, and they're creditors of the business. Um, there are some disadvantages, um, as always, with um, a convertible loan note. Um, firstly, uh, it, it has an impact being debt on the balance sheet, and we'll talk about that a little later on as well. Um, it, it can create creditor concerns, um, so suppliers to the business um, you know, may, may not be as willing to extend credit um, where they see the balance sheet is looking a little weak. Um, one, one of the potential downsides is, is this non-alignment between um, the management and, and directors and, and the investors into the loan notes. And the non-alignment um, you know, really sits in the fact that it, if you contrast that with an equity investment where the money has gone into the business um, and it's, is not extractable until an exit event, a loan note is, is, a, is a debt instrument and in certain circumstances you know, can be called to be repaid. Um, so that, that, that's sort of non-alignment number one or misalignment number one, um, but also where you've got an instrument that will uh, convert at a discount to the next round funding price, uh, the, the, there, might, there might be a misalignment in terms of the existing investors in the business not necessarily willing to or wishing the company to go out at a very large valuation. Um, whereas if you had um, equity investments, then the higher the valuation for the next round, you know, probably the better. Uh, finally, and we'll talk a bit, little bit more about um, EIS relief it, um, in, in a second, but convertible loan notes are not um, compliant with uh, an investor taking EIS relief, so you know, it's not therefore suitable for uh, angel investors who want that relief. So convertible loan notes, as I said a minute ago, are flexible um, and are designed to be deployed quickly. Um, so they are typically provided in an unsecured fashion, um, but convertible loan notes can equally be secured. Um, the complexities around um, taking a debenture and the additional paperwork involved, um, and perhaps the, the fact that whether the, whether the note is secured or not, probably doesn't make a big difference in the end because with these bridging rounds, um, the outcome is usually relatively binary in that either the company um, does succeed in getting that new financing round or, or it, it doesn't. And uh, what might be left for creditors is, is often not a huge amount. Um, so convertible loan notes are typically viewed as quasi-equity. Um, and they would normally convert into the most senior class of share in the business um, and usually the, the class of share uh, for that next funding round. Um, interest, um, I think we are, one of the things that we are beginning to see a little is interest um, coming onto loan notes um, and the certainly going back you know, 12, 12 months or so, Interest, if, if it was there, would only be payable if the loan notes were redeemed as opposed to converted. But I think we're beginning to see um, interest also accruing and forming part of the conversion. 
Um, so fundamentally, uh, what are the points at which the loan will either convert or be redeemed? As I've already mentioned, first and foremost, the future funding round is what everyone is gunning towards and hopefully will achieve. And at that point, there is typically an automatic conversion of the loan note into equity. Uh, usually the senior class of equity issued in that funding round, and it's often at a discount. And if I was going to pick a single number for that, I would probably say 20%. So at a 20% discount to that next funding round price, or um, if lower, the valuation cap. The valuation cap is relatively common, I would say, in convertible loan notes. Um, so in effect, the, the loan notes would convert at the price, the lower price of the discount or when keyed against that valuation cap. Um, it's 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 worth worth noting here actually when when you're talking on uh, with that next uh, funding round in mind and the valuation that you might look to achieve there, um, be clear whether or not the convertible loan notes are included within the the pre money valuation or whether they would be counted as part of the round. It, it's difficult to build that into the loan note at at, at the time the loan note is drawn, um, but certainly be aware of that when you're when you're talking about the valuation for the round into which the note will convert um, because it obviously makes a difference to uh, dilution for the other shareholders. Um, other circumstances where the notes uh, either convert or are redeemed, a change of control um, and increasingly we're seeing that at the discretion of the lender either into uh, equity, either at a pre-agreed price or at a discounted price to the sale price, or uh, to be redeemed and then typically with a premium. And I, I, the, the the future fund that we'll talk about later on, the, the premium there is 100%. And if I was going to give one number, I think I would probably say that the, the premium is 100%, but that, that is a, a, a wide variable. Um, and I've seen anything from you know no no premium but just interest up to you know, a two hundred percent premium M most most loan, loan notes don't deal with IPOs um, because if the company achieves an IPO it's likely to be a funding round and therefore would be caught by the automatic conversion in any event um, there aren't many IPOs that um, go through the market where it's, a sim it's simply an admission to the market rather than a fundraise. And then I, I guess the last couple of bullets there, the long stop date and the event of default, the, the less happy outcomes, um, certainly the event of defaults, which are typically insolvency related events. A, a long stop date, um, and one of the questions that we had in advance was what would we typically see here? Um, well, in part, it depends on, you know, when when are you expecting to do that next fundraise? And I think a lot of people who are doing convertible loan notes, you know, right now are looking to buy at least a 12-month um, window of breathing space to allow the economic conditions to recover, to allow the bi the business to recover and progress before they look to raise further money in the market. So. Uh, 12 to 18 months would be um, a typical long stop date for a convertible loan note. Um, final bullet points down there at the bottom, warranties and side letters. In the UK, you often don't see warranties um, with convertible loan notes um, for the reason that it's difficult to establish what loss you have suffered um, because you'll either be repaid or you won't or the note will convert or it won't. Um, and side letters, I think a, a perhaps a more common uh, U.S. trait here, but you know, might include most favoured nation provisions, information provisions, or similar. So, so an alternative to a convertible loan note, which um, is potentially EIS friendly, is the advanced subscription agreement, uh, which can contain many of the economic features of a convertible loan note. 
uh, but importantly can't carry any debt like features um, and the, the the revenue have recently announced um, further guidelines um, and the most important of which uh, is, is the one down at the bottom there um, where, where the advanced subscription agreements have to convert into equity uh, at a long stop date of no more than six months for it to be a EIS qualifying instrument. Pre prior to that, 12 months was deemed to be satisfactory, so that's quite a big change um, and may not be sufficient to get the company through uh, the, pro you know, the projected bridge period. Um, the other clarifications relate to um, it being, you know, it carry no debt like features, so even on insolvency, the advanced subscription has to convert into equity um, and they have to have no investor protection such as consent rights, negative controls and, and the like. Um, I will pass to Mike now to talk about safes. Thanks, Howard. Um, so safes are something that I think for those of you in the UK, you, you, you may hear occasionally from either a US investor or, or a, a US colleague. Um, the good news is, is they're fairly similar to an ASA. Um, a safe is, is something that came, around, came about about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, um, or really became, became in vogue about, about 10 or 12 years ago in the, in the U.S. Um, it, it refers to a simple agreement for future equity. Um, it also, there's a, a, another form of it uh, called the KISS, which is a keep it simple uh, security. Um, and both of them were promoted by a couple of different uh, one point safes originally were kind of promoted by Y Combinator and, and Kisses were promoted by 500 startups. Um, generally speaking, whenever we see our U.S. Um, investors uh, wander into investing into to U.K. companies, um, they will often lead with a, hey, could we do this if, they, if that's something that they do? Um, and usually they quickly flip over to a, an ASA. There's a couple noteworthy differences though that I do want to um, uh, highlight. Um, and this applies to any time you have a U.S. investor coming in. Um, it, it's not uncommon for you to be doing a deal and one of your investors, you manage to pull in an investor from the U.S. And at the 11th hour, they say, oh, by the way, we need a couple of things in the document. And they're, they're largely technical points. Um, but the three things that we typically see are one, and these are often in, in safe documents here. One is the what we call the Securities Act uh, accredited investor uh, representations, um, and that's just to make sure that it qualifies from a U.S. securities law perspective. And those are relatively straightforward. Most of them are are representations and warranties that come from the um, from the investor itself. There that they're basically accredited and, and, and sophisticated enough to do the transaction. The other two items kind of occasionally panic uh, companies whenever they see them at the 11th hour. Um, they're usually uh, U.S. tax uh, um, uh, undertakings. Um, one refers to, you'll hear people talk about the CFC and the PFIC. Um, the CFC rules are the Controlled Foreign Corporation rules. It relates to a non-U.S. Uh, corporate entity in which, a, which U.S. investors uh, potentially have control of that company. So if a U.S. investor invests into, it, into a, a U.K. limited um, they need to be careful about not tripping up the CFC rules that, that may require the tax to be treated uh, um, or, or the, the effect of the, the investment and the effect of certain income uh, in the UK limited may be treated as if it's a pass-through entity um, for U.S. tax purposes. Uh, and then the other piece is what's called the PFIC, the Pass Support Investment Com uh, Company uh, requirements. And this is uh, really pertaining to, um, you know, companies that, that generate passive income, um, so dividends, interest, um, and the like there, and our non-U.S. entities, uh, they're perceived as potential tax shelters there. Um, for the most part, most operating companies in the U.K. don't run afoul of these, but make sure that you're just, you, you early on, if you have a U.S. investor coming into one of your rounds, um, you, often if you're converting from a safe, to make sure that you understand what they're asking about that there. Um, with that, I think, Howard, you're going to take it forward, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, corporate and other approvals here, I believe, correct? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, so just a little bit of, I guess, a little bit of detail. Um, a convertible loan note or an ASA um, w will require certain corporate approvals. Uh, clearly, a board minute or a board meeting um, will be required to approve um, entering into those transactions, uh, but sometimes forgotten. But the, the, the notes and ASAs will convert into equity or, or 
could convert into equity um, automatically and therefore you need to get your shareholder approvals up front so authority to allot and waiving preemption rights um, otherwise as directors you'd be entering into contracts that you uh, couldn't fulfill without breaching those duties um, or, or statutory requirements um, for companies who have already got um, investors uh, in, in the business um, and, and a shareholder agreement, then there will inevitably be um, a shopping list of reserve matters which require investor consent in advance. So again, you will probably need to get your investors to consent to entering into these transactions. And then if you've got um, any, any contracts, so I'm thinking particularly warrant instruments that may contain um, contractual preemption rights or side letters with other investors giving them super pro rata um, investment rights on future rounds, then you need to address that uh, before you enter into these um, instruments uh, and seek appropriate waivers or allow them to participate. And then finally, if, if you have any form of senior debt um, or a venture debt where, where security has been granted or even where you've granted unsecured debt uh, which has got restrictions on what you may do in the future, um, you'll need to get the consents of the appropriate lenders um, who may require the convertible loan note holders to enter into subordination deeds so that the convertible loan notes will be subordinated to uh, that senior debt. Just to touch very briefly on directors' duties, um, which I'm sure everyone is, is familiar with, um, but, but there's, a, there's a couple of um, misconceptions that I just thought it would be useful to mention here. And, and the first is that you know, whether you are an executive director um, of the business or a non-executive director of the business, or whether you're nominated by a particular shareholder to be a director of the business, your statutory and fiduciary duties to the company are the same and the levels of um, obligation to the company are the same. So the, the burden doesn't fall more heavily with the executive directors, for example. Um, and all directors have the duty to promote the success of the company for the benefit of the members as a whole. Um, and not any one particular class of shareholders and not um, a shareholder who has nominated you, for example, to be a director. Um, other things that might be relevant um, when deciding uh, on, on whether to enter into the bridge arrangements, um, particularly where directors are participating or are representatives of funds that are participating, then um, declaration of interests is is required and then just a little bit deeper in terms of director duties um, when considering um, a convertible loan note loan note for the for, for a bridging round um, the, the, the there's a there's a there's a shift that takes place um, where a company is on the cusp of insolvency um, where the director duties move from acting in the best interests of shareholders to acting in the best interests of creditors um, and taking on more debt um, could could tip the company into um, an in, at least a, a technical insolvent situation so if we just look at the definition of insolvency so it's a company who is unable to pay its debts when um, the debts fall due, which is the cash flow test. Now that, um, with money in the bank from your convertible loan note or, or other bridge, um, should be satisfied, um, at least in the near term. But the, the, the test that may well be failed is the, is the balance sheet test, which is the amount of the company's liabilities, taking into account actual contingent and prospective liabilities, if that exceeds the assets of the business on a balance sheet basis, then the company is technically insolvent. So, you know, most, I think it's fair to say most companies, um, you know, may be in, in that sort of uh, 
remit um, and, and certainly venture-backed businesses, businesses that are pre-revenue um, who are drawing convertible loan notes, you know, will, will almost certainly be in that position. So the directors need to consider carefully drawing debt, um, but the, 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 the answer and the trick um, here is that um, the directors should be able to form and hopefully can form um, the, the view that there is a reasonable prospect of avoiding an insolvent liquidation. And if they can do that, then it would be appropriate to draw down the loan note, continue trading and incurring liabilities. Um, and and the, obviously the purpose of the loan note here um, is to bridge the company from where you sit today through to the next funding round. So whilst the company has an expectation of being able to achieve that next funding round, then with the situation should be fine. And as I say, the, the company can draw down the convertible loan note. Um, again, not, not wishing to dampen the mood further, but um, I guess both in the run up to drawing down a convertible loan um, or other bridge um, or during the period following that through to the time when the company um, raises the next funding round. Um, directors need to be cognizant of the, the wrongful trading rules um, and, and particularly um, given that um, where, where directors are found to have wrongfully traded, they may um, be incurring personal liability um, to the extent of any increased creditor claim, claims during that period when the company is trading uh, wrongfully. Um, so the, the, the test is whether uh, the company continues to trade beyond the time when the directors knew or ought to have known that there was no reasonable prospect of the company avoiding an insolvent liquidation. Um, and as I say, for a, for a venture-backed business, um, so long as you have a reasonable prospect of getting to that next funding round, then you, know, you, you should be okay. But what, the test of whether you ought um, to, to have known is both an objective test, so looking at what, what, a, what a reasonably competent director should have known, but also a subjective test. So what should a director with his or her particular experience and qualifications have known? And I, I guess, a, a, um, a, a finance director, CFO, uh, you know, will often have a heightened um, sense of ha sh what, what they should have known here um, due to their background and training. And if you are in a position where the company is wrongfully trading, um, there, is, there is a defense providing that you, you take every step to minimize losses for creditors um, and if you do that, then you should be able to avoid uh, personal liability. But as I say, um, ho hopefully um, you will be in a position where you are powering forward uh, with a view to raising that next funding round. And during that period, there should be you know, no, no, no um, implications for wrongful trading. Um, just as a, as a sort of a, a practical point, um, where you are leading up to the next funding round, whether that's the bridge or the next equity raise, uh, do keep full board minutes and the board should be meeting more regularly um, to assess the financial position of the company so that you can conclude on a weekly or daily basis if necessary that the company is still, um, still, still has that reasonable prospect of avoiding an insolvent liquidation. Uh, COVID-19, so the, go the government have announced a relaxation for wrongful trading, which on the face of it sounds like good news, but um, to date th there has been no legislation to implement that, and in any event there are other grounds for or potential personal, per personal liability such, a, such as misfeasance and a compensation order. So I think be prudent is, is the message there. Uh, and back to Mike. Thanks, Art. Um, so I think we, uh, before we get into a little final uh, stretch here on the latest uh, goings on on the future fund, 
just wanted to highlight also, you know, the the other thing is is, is as you know, awful as is this downturn, you know, has appears to be, and I think Howard, you cited back to seventeen oh or seventeen oh nine, I think was the last time that we were looking at some macroeconomic numbers. Um, quite this dramatic here. Um, there is a little bit of history repeating itself in these types of downturns here, and so I wanted to just make sure we hi highlighted, um, you know, where things historically um, tend to go wrong, and just you know, as a reminder, it's not necessarily to uh, uh, to hit these, you know, uh, uh, or belabor these points here, but these are the types of things where these convertible rounds um, can go sideways, and and frankly, um, when everything is up and to the right, um, when it comes to the economics. Um, it's the legal risk is is a lot lower, right? Um, but it's really in the downturn situation, or when you know you're trying to make it through that next couple months of of, of keeping the company afloat, um, as Howard was just alluding to um, on on just the solvency of the company, um, that things can go go pretty bad. Um, so you know, n number one, although we talked about the speed of all this here, just beware of rush transactions. Um, you know, making a decision in a vacuum. Um, oftentimes leads to either you know some some ugly terms or um, or you know strained relations between the investor and the company um, or you know taking acting on something sooner than than, than you necessarily need. Um, a lot of it's interesting you know as we look back a couple of weeks back in the U.S. we had a number of, of um, recent uh, economic stimulus, stimulus events going on. And we got calls left and right, similar to our kind of equivalent of the future fund there of the, uh, under what's called the CARES Act. And it was a lot of hurry up and tell me if we should, if we can or should do this. And, and it was interesting to see a number of companies realize that as they kind of deliberated a little bit, some, you know, it was right for some people, but not for others. So, and that also leads into that deliberation process. So as, as Howard mentioned also, things like keeping good minutes, but you know, building building a process around any transaction um, goes a long way towards protecting uh, on the back end. So make sure you keep good minutes, as Howard mentioned there, but it's also the discussion itself. Um, that will lead to good outcomes. Uh, working collaboratively with your existing investors, um, it, it, you'll, you'll find solutions there. Um, and make sure that you do that with the backdrop of, of the fiduciary duties that, that Howard was, was speaking to. I always make a point whenever we're in a you know, kind of aggressive, uh, we, we get an aggressive set of terms or it's a downturn situation with, with my clients to do a rehash on fiduciary duties at a board meeting before we, we finalize the deal. Um, sometimes, you know, di directors and, and, and uh, uh, investors roll their eyes at the extra process there, but in the end, um, they, they, they end up getting the benefit of that if it ever becomes a dispute later on there. So, um, be mindful about approvals. The other thing that we see goes wrong on, on these types of deals is they're rushed and nobody bothered to take a look at the at the articles, the shareholder agreement. Um, you know, Howard mentioned also the side letters, which you tend to see a little bit more in, in you know on, on in a handful of US rounds there, but um, make sure that you've checked to make, that that all the approvals are there because these are the types of things where things go go sideways. Um, if if for example there is an individual investor that had a right to, you know, some sort of pro rata participation that was you know, forgotten. Um, also, understand the economics. Uh, what happens in a lot of these deals is you know you get some convoluted economics of, of trying to solve for you know not uh, forcing a, a ugly valuation outcome or an ugly valuation cap. So investors and, and founders get together and start putting together you know kind of convoluted uh, uh, terms around that. Make sure you understand where it takes you. Um, I think that's a, a big problem that, that we see in a lot of rounds where the investor uh, uh, comes in, solves for it. Um, the founder initially thinks they understand it. And then later on, the founder is not motivated because it, the economics are creating a lot of pressure on them. Um, and that uh, that creates a, a, a lot of challenges for the long-term viability of the company there. Um, look out for insider-driven processes um, that, that basically you know are to the detriment of minority shareholders. So Sometimes you know you have great investors who come in. They're trying to save the company from you know from running out of cash, but they throw down a deal that is um, you know pretty one-sided, and and somehow it gets accepted without deliberation, and and that creates uh, some challenges uh, later on there, and, and the minority shareholders get squeezed. Um, you know, always bear in mind rights offerings. You see this more in the UK, and the um, the, the uh, companies are a little more mindful of this because. Uh, preemptive rights tend to be um, more enshrined um, in the uh, 
in the Companies Act than they are in, in most U.S. jurisdictions. But always just be mindful about, you know, if you're waiving uh, preemptive rights, what the effect is on on doing that in a uh, in a bridge round where there might be aggressive terms for an investor or favorable terms for an investor. And then lastly, as we mentioned, just also look out for the um, the effect on the next round or on a change of control. If, if it creates a large premium or a, a large discount where it kind of has a disproportionate effect, it's going to have a chilling effect on future investors coming in. So all that can um, can affect the future. So you may save the next three months or the next year of funding there, but then you're going to be renegotiating uh, later on to uh, to get that next investor in there. So, Howard, I think we were, you were going to speak to the uh, the future fund next, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, and c c conscious that we're um, running short of or have already run out of time, um, I I'll be reasonably quick. Um, just before I get there, uh, we had a question on the ASAs. What happens if um, that there isn't an automatic conversion within the six-month time frame? Then the, the the ASA would require the the, the company to issue shares um, at, at the pre-agreed price that's in there, um, because the an ASA can never be repayable. So at that long stop date, it has to convert. Um, Hi everyone, I'd like to apologise for that. Um, I think we just start off the line. I'll be back shortly. Hi. Hi, um, Molly. It's, yes, Howard. Um, back. Apologies for that um, technical problem. Um, so, for those of you who um, had time after the hour and who haven't yet dialed off, um, I was going to very quickly talk about the future fund. Um, which we were very pleased to be helping uh, support the government uh, uh, put in put in place. Um, as I mentioned a little while ago, um, it's it's 250 million uh, fund uh, which will be delivered by the government in partnership with the British Business Bank, um, and will require matched funding. The scheme is set up to be a light touch process. Um, so that the government is not uh, necessarily involved in um, negotiation of the document. So it's very much a, a, co a cookie cutter process. Um, the government wouldn't be involved with um, due diligence, for example, and will rely upon the matched funders to do the due diligence in terms of um, being willing to participate, and then the government will match that uh, funding. It's intended for companies uh, as I said previously, who maybe don't have access to some of the other uh, COVID-19 support mechanisms put in place. Um, the companies will need to be a UK registered company, um, will need to have, as I said, matched funding from third party investors, historically must have raised at least £250,000 in the last five years. Uh, however, there, there is those are not the full eligibility criteria which will follow. Um, I had hoped that we would have received um, that information at this point, but uh, I think um, the government have said that that will come during May, so uh, hopefully in the next week or two. So the government will provide um, money via these convertible loan notes, which will be unsecured. Um, on a matched basis and with a minimum of 125,000, a maximum of £5 million pounds going into individual businesses. Um, the proceeds of the funding um, should be used for working capital purposes. There are some specific exceptions, so it cannot be used to repay existing borrowings, can't be used to pay dividends or staff bonuses. Um, the the loan will have a, an 8% per annum non-compounding interest, or if higher, that the interest as agreed with the private investors. We had one question come in, which was what happens if the notes converts after, say, two years? Uh, well, only two years of interest will have accrued during that period, and that will be the, uh, the obligation on the company to either repay or, com or convert. And then... It, the government have proposed a 36-month term, which, as we've discussed earlier on, is actually slightly longer than you might normally see in a typical convertible loan. And I think the, the reasoning in here is to give the companies as long a period as possible to either succeed or not um, before the 
uh, loan gets to maturity. Um, I will touch very briefly on uh, the, the conversion mechanics and, and conversion price. Uh, but as with most instruments, the, convert, the future fund loan will convert into the most senior class of share um, in, the, in issue on the date of conversion. Uh, there is a slight nuance here in that if the company then raises a further equity within the six months following conversion, then the share class to which uh, the note holders were previously um, issued will be upgraded to that new class. And this is an anti-avoidance measure, which I would say is relatively unusual for a convertible loan note. Um, as typically, the note is intended to convert automatically on a qualifying fundraising, which is set in this instance as an amount equal to the bridge loan. So if the government and match funding is a million pounds, if the company raises a subsequent million pounds through an equity raise, then the note will convert. If the company raises a non-qualifying fundraise, i.e. less than that, then the majority of the note holders can decide to convert the note in any event. And then the other uh, exit or maturity events, um, the notes will convert um, or on a sale or an IPO uh, if that provides the lenders with a greater return than repayment of the loan with a 100% premium. And on maturity at the election of the matched holders, although note that the government um, the default position is that the government will convert into equity unless the government specifically requests repayment. In terms of the conversion price, uh, the, the market standard rate of 20% has been applied here unless the private investors agree a greater discount, in which case the government will get the benefit of that. Uh, and the same would apply on conversion on an IPO sale or the maturity date, which would be a 20% discount to the most recent non-qualifying funding round. There is a slight nuance here in that if a non-qualifying funding round hasn't taken place since the loan was drawn down, then it would simply convert at the price of that prior round rather than at a discount to it. Interest uh, will be either repaid at the discretion of the company or will convert um, into, into equity, but uh, interest will not carry a discount, so it will just, it will just convert at, at face value. And as I've said already, um, the government won't be imposing a valuation cap, so it's, it's a simple discount, a 20 cent discount, unless the private investors agree a valuation cap, in which case that valuation cap would apply equally to the government. So repayment, as I mentioned a, a second ago, will happen on a sale or an IPO if that, that um, results in a greater return to the lenders than a conversion. And on maturity, at the option of the matched holders, the majority of the matched holders, um, it will be repaid with a 100% premium. And again, as, as previously, the government will naturally convert unless they specifically require a repayment. Unlike many uh, standard UK convertible loan notes, there are one or two additional um, protections and benefits for the, for the note holders um, built into the document. Uh, there, there are some limited corporate governance rights, so the note holders and on conversion into equity as shareholders will obtain information rights. The note holders will benefit from a limited suite of warranties, including in particular that the company satisfies the eligibility criteria. Uh, there's a most favored nation provision so that if the company subsequently raises an additional convertible debt on better terms, then the government and its match funders will get the benefit of those terms as well. There's a negative pledge in relation to senior debt, um, unless that senior debt is from a Bodo Friday lender, which will not be um, an existing shareholder or matched investor. And then finally, transfer rights. The 
government will have specific rights to transfer both the loan notes and ultimately the shares that are issued on conversion where it's selling a portfolio of 10 or more uh, companies um, through the through the scheme and in that instance it will be able to transfer its shares as a permitted transfer to uh, the an institutional investor who is buying that portfolio of shares so very lastly um, the market response has has been um, I, I think broadly supportive uh, there, there are one or two aspects which have not been um, entirely matched uh, received favorably w one is that the match funding will, will not be eligible for EIS or VCT relief and not eligible for VC for EIS because um, it's it's a loan that converts um, and not eligible for VCT relief because the loan the term of the loan is less than five years um, there are other questions around what, what does a substantive economic presence actually mean. Um, the devil will be in the detail when the full eligibility criteria you know, is, is um, released. Is there scope for negotiation? No, it's intended as a cookie cutter, one size fits all, and the match funding must be into the same instrument. Now, whether th these new terms, I, I would say the 20% discount is pretty much standard. A 100% premium uh, return on IPO or change of control, I would say, is now market standard in any event. But you know, these these terms could could I guess lead the way in terms of what future convertible loan notes will look like. And then the I think the biggest um, or the, the most frequently asked question at the moment is what's the application process who needs to do it is there an advanced assurance process to uh, see if we are eligible is it first come first serve and the answers to those, those questions are not yet known um, I suspect that uh, there will no there, will, there won't be an advanced assurance process um, but um, we wait to see. I, th I think it will be the the lead matched investor who will make the application process, um, <clears throat> and the the government will uh, look at the individual applicants, confirm that the that the you know the company matches um, the criteria, and then give the green light for the matched funders to to fund. And for once the company has received the money, the government will then release its portion of the loan. Uh, but as I say, the devil uh, will to some extent be in the detail once the full eligibility and anti-avoidance criteria are announced, hopefully in the next week or so. That, I'm afraid we've, we've run 15 minutes over, and I do apologize for the uh, technical issues. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone for attending and particularly I'd like to thank uh, Mike and Evgenia for their very interesting contributions to the discussion. Uh, please look out for the next webinar invite which will be coming your way very soon but for now thank you very much. <laughs>